And Jesus met me in the depths of my pain, and my life changed forever. Welcome to Matters of Soul Importance, where we dive deeply into topics of both earthly and eternal consequence. I'm Roxanne Solonen, faith columnist and features writer for The Forum, author, and speaker. Today's episode continues our conversation with Jody Clemens, a post-abortive woman helping answer the question, is abortion really health care? In part one, Jody began laying out her answer to this question by bringing us through the story of how she ended up choosing abortion, and very soon after, or even during the procedure, came to quickly regret it. What happened then? It's important that we hear about the after effects of abortion. Only then can our hearts move. Of course, every abortion story is different, but have you ever heard of a child saying they want to grow up someday and be a doctor or nurse who performs or helps with abortions? Unless pushed by an adult, it's unlikely for a child to dream of going into this line of work. Children are by nature very intuitive about something not being quite right about abortion when they learn what it is. It might be because they are closer to the time in which they could have been aborted. That proximity and their natural inclinations points to something that we adults can learn from as well. But I think it's important to mention something else as it relates to Jody's perspective, and you'll hear a lot about it in this second portion. Often, the pro-life side is criticized for only caring about the pre-born child. Nothing could be further from the truth, and Jody is a living witness to this. She is post-abortive and also now very pro-life, and the last thing she wants for those who've experienced abortion is for them to be imprisoned in shame. That's not freedom. In this second segment, we'll find out how this post-abortive woman, and I would argue many pro-lifers, feel about the women who have experienced abortion, along with the fathers of the aborted babies. After Jody finishes sharing about how she processed this great loss— She offers a lot of hope for post-abortive women, so you'll want to listen to the very end. There is hope after abortion. Jody has found it and lives in it, and she wants it for others. Now, let's hear the rest of Jody's story. Share a little bit about that, your own life. I know ultimately it's a story of healing, so we'll get to that too. But what happened before that, before the healing? Oh, before the healing? Well, I left the abortion clinic. I left my career, the reasons I had my abortion. I left the father of the baby. Um, I disappointed all those people I did not want to disappoint. My life spiraled out of control. Every reason why I chose abortion, or at least I thought I chose abortion, I left. I left. And my life was just like we're talking about. I I didn't even have a job anymore, Roxanne. I quit everything. I, I could not function well in society. And my, you know, I, I did engage in self-destructive behavior. Um, and again, I lived in this secrecy and silence for years and experienced a lot of self-condemnation. Women hate themselves. Many women hate themselves after an abortion. Um, I totally remember this too, Roxanne. I moved from knowing what I had done was bad, like, okay, abortion is bad, Jody. I mean, that's why I was doing this, to repeatedly thinking and telling myself, I'm bad. I'm a bad person. Do you see the shift? Mm-hmm. You know, like shame consumed me greatly and caused me to just flee from people. Just flee from them. Um, and in and, and, and doing that, you pick up other unhealthy behaviors. Like I became a perfectionist. Like everything had to be just how I wanted it because I feared others would see me for who I truly was. And they would either leave me or reject me. It's like you're wearing a scarlet day. We've heard that on our chest, Right. I am one of those women. And I also felt, Roxanne, and I know this to be true. I know this for, I know this for many women who've had abortion. I also felt that because God knew what I had done. See, it was never a secret to God. <laughs> <laughs> I felt that God had no other alternative than to punish me and send me to hell. 
in my isolation that I was living in at that time, I felt that what I was done was 100% worse than anything anyone else had ever done. This is the worst thing I ever could have done. And I just waited for God to just drop the hammer on me. This is what's going to happen because you did this, you know. And I, and I truly felt I deserved it, you know. I think women who've had abortion, and I'll speak for myself again, I was physically and emotionally exhausted as I struggled to keep this secret under wraps. No one could know. Mm-hmm. And yet in doing that, Roxanne, I never, ever talked about my abortion. But there wasn't a day that I didn't think about it. It haunted me. But we don't talk about it. No one could know. It's my secret. Mm. And my abortion, actually, how I would describe it is it started defining every aspect of my life. My abortion became who I was. Mm. I'm a woman who had an abortion. And you don't feel worthy. There's a lot of issues that women go through, you know, with abortion. I think one of the big ones that's not talked about enough is just our whole sense of femininity. What happens to that with women who had an abortion? I'm less than a woman. What woman does this to their child? And women react to that in different ways. Some women will just go overboard one way and just like look beautiful all the time. There's other women that will just let themselves go. How long did the negative effects last? Like in years? Like at what point? Did something turn, and and what was that? Okay, my life did go on, and I want I want your audience, listening audience, to know this that I eventually er- entered a marriage, and I entered that marriage without telling my husband about my abortion, because I was convinced that if he knew who I truly was, who would ever marry a woman that's had an abortion? That's how I was thinking, and I lived in fear, daily fear that my husband, after we had married, after I married him, would find out about my abortion and that he would divorce me. So I lived with a secret sin within the realm of God's holy matrimony of one man and one woman. There was times, uh, many times I would say, I recall feeling this, and it, it's, it's such twisted thinking, but it's where I was when you're asking me this question. I thought that if he would just divorce me or leave me, that would be easier and safer for me than him finding about my finding out about about my dirty little secret. That's twisted, mm. but that's how Satan gets us in this fear. And that that's honestly what a secret does in any person's life. That's why the enemy of our souls, or even if you're not a Christian, as you said, this becomes who we are. I am this woman. And we're feeling this way about ourselves. So we assume that everybody else is going to feel this way about us also. So in my life, I lived like that for 10 years with no relief. And this is what I was battling, as most women are. We have undealt with sin. We we don't dare go to God. No, I mean like, no, I'm not going to go to the priest. I'm not going to go to anybody. I'm not dealing with this because I don't want them to know, right? Unresolved grief. We already talked about that. You can't grieve in a healthy, normal manner. And then there's a sense of justice. The guilty is not being punished. And we live like that. I can tell you, and this is not just true of me, there are women I've talked to who say things like, death would have been welcomed because we're living like this. You have to know 10, 20, 30, 40. I just did a retreat for women, a healing retreat for women who've done abortion or who've had abortions. They're coming there. How long ago? 40 years. 40 mm-hmm. years. 20 years. Well, 20 yeah, years. and hearing you, it's like, you know, you're moving on with your life and you even got married, but, but marriage actually almost made it worse. Like it plunged you into oh. deeper because you have that intimacy with your husband and you have this part of yourself that you aren't sharing. And that now becomes another weight. Mm-hmm. It it's does. just like you keep getting further and further. And intimacy and marriage is another mm-hmm. aftermath problem that women experience after an abortion. It, it just is. It, the intimacy triggers your mind back to what led to my abortion, right? And in those 10 years, by the way, I had four children. And I just kept thinking, I had four children of five and a half years. I kept thinking, oh, this will fix it. This will fix it. That's that's so twisted also as if this child, this innocent baby that's born is going to fix a problem in your life. But women do this. And then another baby and another baby 
and another baby. I love my children deeply. They are gifts from God, but they were not sent to this earth to fix Jody Clemens. Mm. They are not. Mm. So, mm. how do I heal? And truly, <laughs> my friends, listening audience, that would be very sad if that was the end of my story. And sadly, I do tell you that is the end of the story for some women, you know, who take their secret, their guilt, their grief, and their shame to the grave, never knowing there is forgiveness, there is healing, and there is the, there is the gift of being set free. But my story was not over. And God did have a plan for me, as he does for every person who has participated in abortion. So when you talk about men, when you talk about the abortionist, when you talk about people that are taking you to that abortion clinic, their story doesn't have to be over. They all struggle in different ways, Roxanne. There's healing ministries for men who took or paid for an abortion. They struggle with different issues. They struggle with paying for it, for not being there, for not saying, I'll support you. Men struggle. Former abortionists, we've talked about that. But they don't have to stay where they are in this this place of grieving and unforgiveness and shame and guilt. God does a plan for God does have a plan for each of us. It's a plan to give us mm-hmm. a hope and a future. And our good and gracious God, I'm gonna tell you what, my friends, He never stops loving us. He never stops pursuing us. In fact, He is a good shepherd who will leave the ninety nine and come after the come after the one. I was that one. You were that one, Roxanne. Everyone listening is that one. And God will leave the 91, 99 to come and find you. And I learned, as many women do, that we are not exempt from God's grace. And God did that in my life with just two, two Bible verses from his word to show me this, which is a powerful testimony, by the way, to the word of God. And it was from Luke 5, 31 and 32. And this is what it says. Jesus answered them, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You see, in my mind, Jesus had always come for the good guys, not the bad guys like me. And I heard a someone in the pulpit, and it was an evangelist, say that. And then he said it again. It's not the healthy who need the doctor, it's the sick. And after hearing these words, now keep in mind, I'm at home in the living room watching this on TV. (laughs) It's not in a church. Um, I didn't feel I could go to church. I felt unworthy, to be very honest. But anyway, um, I'm watching this on TV and hearing this evangelist. It was Billy Graham. Uh, you know, an evangelist. Anyway, he s- reads these verses, and I feel like he's speaking right to me. Right to me, I feel like. And after hearing these words, I fell to my knees, and I cried out to God in the living room of my home, alone in the dark of the evening. And I said, if this is true, if this is true, God, I am one sick woman, and unless you save me, I surely shall die. I then had an encounter that I'd never had before, Roxanne, in which I sensed the heavens open and the healing warmth of God's love invade and melt my heart. God's amazing grace was reaching down and started just stitching together my shredded soul, every fiber of my being. I was a messy woman laying on the floor of my living room, and I was now breathing in the breath of God and His mercy and His grace flooded my entire being. And I want to tell you, my life started to radically changed. I personally, personally for me, I just developed first how God worked in my life is I developed a deep desire to soak in the word of God. And when I did that, God's word became alive to me. It never had before, but it did now. And I did learn that God knew every sin I'd ever committed, including the sin of abortion. He also knew every deed I'd ever done. (laughs) He knew everything. This is never a secret to him. And yet, listen, listen, my friends. God was willing to walk into my place of shame, my guilt. And I felt as if God said to me, Jody, I see you. I hear you. I forgive you. I've never left you, and I will never leave you. 
And Jesus met me in the depths of my pain, and my life changed forever. Then in time, <laughs> you know, um, I'll make this quick, but in time I heard that still small voice of the Holy Spirit say, now go and tell. Tell others of my, of my amazing grace, my forgiveness. And you know, Roxanne, I, I wanted to do that so much for the Lord. I wanted to tell others what I'd done, but I knew that meant telling my husband and my children, which I had not done yet. I hadn't done it. And I would like to tell you, my friend, that I just jumped right on that. <laughs> and I got my husband and I got my children. But the truth is, I can tell you, fear set in again. And my mind was flooded with lies. Your husband will leave you. Your children are going to hate you. Um, and I battled that for a while. However, in time, I would actually say with God's help and truly his intervention, I did tell my husband and my children. And people often ask me, how did you do that? What did you say to them? And I'll, it was pretty simple. It was through many tears um, that I shared. And I said to them, before I knew you and before I knew God, I had an abortion. And each of them, my husband and my children, met me with unconditional love and forgiveness. My husband first, and then I sent my four children around the kitchen table before I had you, before I knew you, before I knew God. And one by one, they got up and kissed their mama on the cheek <laughs> mm -hmm. and said, I love you. And since that, I've not looked back. I've stepped out in faith, telling others about the love and tender mercies of God. Um, I have been blessed, as you have, Roxanne, to labor in the pro-life and post-abortion ministries across our state for the last four decades. Um, I am passionately committed, as you are, to take what the enemy means for evil in the lives of women, in the lives of children, in the lives of men, <laughs> and using it instead to advance God's kingdom on the earth. Friends, the world needs to hear the stories of women who've had an abortion, of men who have had abortions, of people who have participated in an abortion, because it is the truth that will set them free and will transfer, will, will exchange the pain that they're feeling for God's peace. You can have grace instead of guilt, and you can have freedom instead of fear. And that is the desire of my heart. I know it's the desire of your heart, Roxanne. Mm -hmm. And for anybody listening out there, who has this hidden secret. You know what? There's people that have a lot of hidden secrets, Roxanne. Absolutely. You know, it's yeah. not just abortion. You know, you can talk about, you can relate the story to any hidden mm -hmm. secret. What is mm -hmm. this doing in your life? Mm -hmm. um, there's many people like me, although under diff different circumstances, who long to go back and undo a past decision. And there are many people, I know this to be true, who harbor feelings of self-hatred, shame, and guilt in our society. We feel we're just broken. We're just too broken. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're a broken vessel that can't be fixed, you know. And I also know this. Because of the statistics, a million abortions a day. A year, excuse me. A year. Million, 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 million. We can't even comprehend. One, abortions, one abortion every 37 seconds. And we can't even keep track, you know, 37 seconds. There's millions of women who've had abortions, and these women live among us. You know, perhaps someone is listening today who's carrying a hidden secret. And perhaps, like you, like me, you feel that your sin is just too big and too bad for God to forgive. I want to assure you that you don't have to live in isolation. You don't have to live in shame. You don't have to live in secrecy. I want you to know that the heart of God is to forgive, the heart of God is to heal, and the heart of God is to set you free. And I know that Roxanne and I would be willing to visit with any of you at any time. Um, I do lead Forgiven and Set Free Healing Retreat Weekends, um, Bible Studies. I also know in our community there's Rachel's Vineyard who has healing retreats for women who've had abortions, there is help available. 
Don't stay stuck. Be free. Beautiful. And, you know, that scripture passage that you read, I came across that recently Mm -hmm. and applying it to a different situation, but it, Mm -hmm. it was beautiful, a beautiful moment. And I just think one passage from God, um, that one. I know. Wow. Like, (laughs) <laughs> we're the we're the ones you we're know the one. yes. yeah and you're the one you know he loves us he wants he us to have life in abundance mm-hmm. he's the god of life he choose is. life not death you know he's given yeah. us a choice that, and that, that is so true roxanne god god is the creator of life yeah that says god loves life that's why an abortion is an abomination we need to love what god loves we have to value what god loves so one of the questions, well, the main question that we're mm-hmm. asking today, we've we've answered a few questions, but but the main one is is abortion healthcare because we're hearing that all over the place and mm-hmm. it's being used to make decisions that are affecting everyone. So what is your response to that, Jody? And you've kind of led into it, but mm-hmm. well, you're absolutely right that it is being touted everywhere. I mean, the left and the media proudly proclaim and promote, by the way, abortion, claiming that it's good health care for women. Meanwhile, Roxanne, we know this, the lives of children are being lost every single day and the hearts of women are breaking at home. That's the truth about abortion. You know, um, we're being lied to. We're being told it's good health care. And you know what? Instinctively, we know this is not, they're not using good health care. It's a lie. It's a ridiculous lie. Um, so what are the reasons? What are some reasons why abortion is not good health care? I think that's what you're asking mm-hmm, me. Mm-hmm. Um, well, first of all, we're being blindsided and lied to. Women are not told the truth about abortion. We um, are not given information that we should be given at abortion clinics, at abortion facilities. I think it's not only, you know, what we hear about abortion, but I think sometimes the greater difficulty is the silence. People are not speaking about this like they mm-hmm. should, Roxanne, mm-hmm. and, and that that is an injustice to women. We have to know what abortion is. You know, I do speak with women who've had abortions. We have a panel. We go speak. But when you look at the millions of women who've had an abortion, these are stories that need to be heard. It is not good health care when you listen to the women who've had an abortion and really suffered the aftermath of that abortion. It is silence who keeps us from knowing the truth about abortion. The truth about abortion and why it is not good health care, and we've already mentioned this once, is that when a woman or when a doctor treats a woman who's pregnant, he is treating two different patients, right? I mean, the baby's got a heartbeat. You go in there and they treat you that. I mean, if you're going to parent your child, they give you ultrasounds. They tell you, take your vitamins. They're giving you ultrasounds, everything. They're two distinct human beings. That is not even hidden anymore. If women want to know the truth, if they weren't touting the lies about or gaslighting us about abortion, women would know this. Just do your homework. When does the heartbeat begin? When does the, when do they develop voice? I mean, everything, Roxanne, is available to us if we look. And as I mentioned earlier, this doctor takes an oath to protect his patients, not to end the life of a patient. Abortion is the intentional taking of a life of a human being. How can that be good health care? It isn't good health care to end the life of a human being. Um, abortion causes, this is another reason why abortion is not good health care for women. <laughs> um, there is an 82% increase in mental health problems after an abortion. That is huge, you know, uh, and we already mentioned this too. 50% of women will experience emotional and mental health problems after an abortion. There's a huge increase um, in the use of substance abuse and suicide among women who've experienced the trauma of abortion. We don't often use that word, but abortion is trauma on a woman. What she's going through is abnormal. It's not how we are created to have a baby. I mean, when we go through labor and carry that child to term, we know what it's like. That's natural. Things are slow. You're progressing. You're going, you know what I'm saying? The, you know, hours, hours. You walk into an abortion clinic. It is not like that. Your body is invaded with an instrument. It is quick. It is like, I don't even want to get into the graphics of it. I'm not going to do that. It is not normal. It is a trauma to the woman's system, to her physical well-being, her emotional well-being. 
her spiritual well-being, all the way around. This is not normal for women. So you wonder why women walk out of there. This is not good health care is my point. You walk out of there and your body has undergone a trauma, but you don't know what to do with it. Because your you body, your mind, and your spirit, like you said, in Emotional. invasion. Everything. I mean, it's it important is. to to, to say those words. It's exactly true because it's not how we are created. Yeah. It is not. It is exact opposite. It is just what I said about natural birth. Share hmm. a little bit before we have to go today about if someone were to approach you about um, and say, I've had an abortion. You've had the privilege of talking to many of these women, and you have your story also to share, which is so beautiful because you know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, every abortion story is different, but we know that it it's trauma, like you said. What do you say to them, Jody? Mm-hmm. Well, this woman may approach you with tearful eyes um, and confide in you that she's had an abortion. Now, I want you to know this is woman is coming to you brokenhearted. She's guilt-ridden. She's feel like I was with shame. And she's most likely engaging in some form of self-destructive behavior. First of all, I want to say congratulations to you if she comes to you because she's found you to be trustworthy. And believe me, she's watching for someone trustworthy. Because women who've had abortions, unfortunately, don't always find that. In fact, we often find the opposite, people talking about what kind of woman would ever have an abortion or who would ever do that. And, you know, we hear those things and we just shut down again and we become more secretive. So she's watching. So if she comes to you, good for you. First, first, let me tell you, it's virtually important that you understand that this dear woman does not want you to justify her actions of her abortion. She knows her culpability. And that's what she's dealing with. She's more than anyone knows, just like I did, that an innocent person had died. And she's guilty. That's why she's coming to you. She is longing for her heart to be healed, the walls of her captivity to be broken, and the guilt of her sin to be removed. That's why she's coming to you. How do I get out of this? So what you do, my friends, is you listen with compassion and then gently lead her. And I mean this, and I am a Christian, so I'll say this to the one and only. The one who left heaven to come to earth to do the will of his Father. The one who died for her sin. The sinless for the sinful, the righteous for the unrighteous. I always assure this woman that God is very close to the brokenhearted. And she's coming to me brokenhearted. But God is close. He also is very close to those crushed in spirit. She's crushed in spirit. God is near. Her brokenness is her key. It honestly is when you know this. God heals a broken heart. It sets a captive free. That brokenness that she's experienced is is her key to accessing God's glorious mercy and grace. You look at that. That's good. God is waiting for her, a repentant and broken sinner, to run into his arms. You know, um, he's very near. And when you get her to that point, um, you know that she would just know what none of us knew, like me, I should say none of us, but she she, you, she needs to know that this sin is not too big or too bad for God to forgive her, because that's how she feels, like 100% I've done the worst thing that anybody could ever do. Reassure her of that. Abortion is not too big, and her pain is not too deep that God cannot forgive her, heal her, cleanse her, and Though her sins are a scarlet, he will make them as white as snow. Um, I want to tell you, too, that she might do that right in your presence, and she may not. She want to ponder this, but you keep leading her that way. And if she does or comes back to you and say, okay, I did that, I asked forgiveness, but I still don't feel forgiveness. It's really important that people understand, and this is so, so, so important, because I've talked to women who say, okay, I've confessed this a hundred times. If I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me of all righteous. And they go, I did it a hundred times. It doesn't work. It's important that you tell this woman that this. Forgiveness is immediate. When we ask God to forgive us, he forgives. He forgives. Healing is a process. It's not immediate. There is a process that this woman has to go through. 
That is why we have post-abortion healing ministries. That is why women, um, this is where they win the victory over this sin. And you tell her that. You tell her, I know where I can get you tangible help. She needs to hear this. One of the faults that people have is this, though. You tell her, you might say to her, I know Rachel's Vineyard, or I know Women's Care Center, or I know Relate Center, or I know um, Forgiven and Set Free. You don't just give her a phone number. You take her to those places and you walk alongside of her as she walks from bondage to freedom. You become her advocate. You become that person who leads her and brings her into hope and to healing. Do what she needs, but she doesn't want you to rationalize it. She's coming because she's broken hearted, broken hearted. And, and it comes back and circles back to that theme of aloneness. Amen. I think you're saying, you know, heal that, begin, be a bridge to, to her not being alone anymore, mm-hmm. which is us acting, you know, with, with God. With compassion. Yeah. I mean, even, even if you weren't a Christian again, uh, and if this woman isn't a Christian, we should have compassion as hearts. Mm-hmm. We hurt for the hurting, mm-hmm. you know, um, you know, this is true for everyone. Bring them to help. Get them help. You know, um, a woman who's hurting like I was and the millions of women who've had an abortion that are in bondage today, bondage to their sin I'm talking about, um, they don't want to hear it. They don't want rationalization. They don't want to be, oh, you're going to be okay. They don't want what well, everybody's doing it. You know, you're whatever. Um, they want to be set free. They're tired. It's like I said, I was just physically, I was emotionally worn out. I was crying for help, but didn't know where to go. I really did not know where to go. And again, I had the secret. You know, I, I couldn't tell my husband. I couldn't. It was, it's such bondage. She wants to be forgiven. She wants to be set free. She wants to move from her grief to grace, like I said, from that pain to peace. Do you know how women who've had abortions long for peace because we're haunted by this? It's so true. Um, I mentioned it. I mean, we don't talk about it. We think about it all the time. Think it. It, it haunts us. It, it haunts us constantly. They want peace. I just remember wanting peace. Just stop. Stop. You know, I, ne- I never found it until... I heard that Bible verse. Most women have had abortions. Don't think it's possible, you know. Well, I hope some people who maybe haven't heard a story like this today will realize that by breaking through the silence and beginning Mm -hmm. to talk about these things, and that we can bring hope to others, Jody. And thank you so much for sharing about your journey towards that darkness, but also into the beautiful hope of God's amazing grace. It's been a privilege to talk with you today. Oh, it's been an honor, and I am humbled to be with you, Roxanne, my coworker in the field, in the ministry field, and just as such a dear friend. So, And again, if I could just add, please reach out. Roxanne is here. Mm -hmm. I am here. You can go to Forgiven and Set Free ND, all one word, Forgiven and Set Free nd.com you will find me there all right well i'll see you on the sidewalk sometime you will. all right god bless you jody thank, <laughs> thank you, you so much my privilege why have we as a society accepted abortion as a way to solve what we deem a problem something that should be our greatest treasure the conception of a brand new unique human life how can we not see that we too were once a preborn child with no voice? As advanced as we are in so many ways, is this really the best we can do? Kill our own offspring? Like Jody, I believe abortion is always a tragedy with devastating consequences. If anyone in your family line had been aborted, you would not exist. Your whole family line would never have come into being, not you or any loved ones after you. What would the world be without you? It would not be the same. It would not be a better world. You are irreplaceable. We need to be more thoughtful about this egregious solution that has caused so much, often secret, pain. Women like Jody and others who have come to understand the toll abortion takes on the human psyche and soul are our hope. 
We need to hear more and more stories like this, and I'm so grateful to Jody for opening the door. Next time on Matters of Soul Importance, we'll tackle a topic that is a little less intense. In episode five, I ask guest Nancy Gord, is God hiding in the pages of good literature? Whether you're an avid reader or a bookworm that just nibbles here and there, you'll appreciate this former English teacher's perspective on how literature can enlighten our earthly journey and possibly even bring us closer to Christ. Until then, don't lose sight of the light. Thank you.